This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's aldermanic briefing. My name is Audrey Wenning. I'm the Director of Transportation at the Metropolitan Planning Council, otherwise known as MPC. We are a public policy and planning organization dedicated to shaping a more equitable, sustainable, and prosperous Chicago region. We are in an independent, nonprofit, and nonpartisan organization, and we do not endorse candidates, but we wanted to provide this today's webinar as an educational platform focusing on transportation and water infrastructure to equip future legislators with what they need to tackle issues in city council and in your wards. Before we begin, I'd like to provide a few housekeeping notes. Because of the number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute for the duration of this call. So you can join the conversation by submitting questions using the chat function on your screen, which will go to organizer only. You can see this chat function in your GoToMeeting control panel toward the bottom. When you submit comments, you'll only be chatting with us, the organizers. I am one of two speakers today and we'll divide our time accordingly and we'll take all our questions after both presentations. At the end of the webinar, we'll also provide you contact information for both of us. Uh, and here is a picture of what we look like. Um, so you can see who's with you today. Again, I'm Audrey Wenning, the Director of Transportation, and um, I'm here with Danielle Gallet, Director of Water Resources. I'm going to cover a few key issues in transportation. It's a very broad area, and there's a lot to talk about, but I'll highlight a few of the top things, um, which you see on this slide, including funding, sustainability, transportation's role in climate change, new mobility, uh, equity, and safety. Funding. There is a great need for sustainable revenue for transportation and for multimodal investments. The gas tax in the state of Illinois was last raised in 1991, and its purchasing power has declined by approximately half really reducing the average Illinoisan's contribution to transportation infrastructure. The mayor recently recommended increasing the gas tax to 30 cents per gallon. Uh, some type of revenue increase is absolutely needed at the state level via user fees. That is, people that are using the system should be paying for the system. And we need to ensure that new funding can be used for multimodal projects. So that's biking, walking, and transit, as well as roads. Transit is certainly a significant economic engine for Chicago, and it's very important to fund that. Let's talk about the current condition of our infrastructure. You've probably noticed that we're facing some challenges and, and really have been suffering chronic underinvestment. Uh, as I noted, the gas tax not having been increased for so long, and much of our transportation funding comes from that state uh, source of uh, funds. The American Society of Civil Engineers has given the following grades for some of our infrastructure. Roads got a D, bridges got a C, uh, transit got a D, and, and rail got a D in terms of the current uh, infrastructure. And then when we look at regionally at our whole transit system, the Regional Transportation Authority that oversees CTA, Metra, and PACE recently published a report just last year showing that 31% of all transit vehicles in this region are past their useful life. So we're really in desperate need for investment if we want to have a highly performing transit system. Now let's look at how uh, we compare to other large cities in terms of how people get around. We have a very robust transit network and we've gotten a lot of media coverage on our bike network, but what matters is how people are actually choosing to travel. As we see in this graphic, the majority of people in the city are getting to work by driving. That's the yellow bar, driving alone. Uh, transit uh, and biking and walking comprise less than half of total trips. And we have a lot more work to get people to commute in the most efficient, affordable, and sustainable modes. It's pretty obvious from the traffic congestion in this city and in the region that we don't want more people commuting by driving alone, uh, which is the least efficient, sustainable, and affordable mode. 
If we look at transit ridership, you may have heard that transit ridership in recent years, which is reflected in this graphic in the orange line, has dropped, um, which is true in the past five years or so. Uh, this is believed to be largely because of increasing number of choices that people have, the advent of ride sharing, so Lyft and Uber and Via and bike sharing, um, the Divi bike sharing system in Chicago. And this is in combination, however, with really stagnant investments and in transit and higher in levels of congestion, which are resulting in bus speeds going down and making transit less competitive. But commuting to work we, is a bright spot uh, in that the line shows that commuting to work ha by transit has ticked up slightly in the past few years. That just goes to show there's more incentive to take the most affordable and efficient mode of travel when you are doing it every single day at the rush hour, when it, there's the most congestion. We want, it, we want people to choose transit because it's good for the city. It's environmentally friendly, it's affordable, it's safe in terms of traffic crashes, and it provides access to economic opportunity. The Metropolitan Planning Council recently completed a study about how transit relates to economic activity. And this, if you'd like to see this report, it's on our website. It includes a, a set of data as well as 15 case studies about businesses and how they relate to transit and support transit. The study showed that workers really want transportation choices, particularly access to transit. Our research showed that many people are choosing not to drive to work and are choosing jobs based on what the commute is like. As you saw, transit ridership is growing a little bit at, at rush hour. Um, the bottom line is that if we want to have a healthy economy, we need to continue to have a healthy transit system uh, and to support it. This study also showed that job growth is stronger near transit. As you see here, businesses are choosing to lo locate near transit so they have access to the largest regional talent pool. Job growth within a quarter mile of a rail station experienced over twice the job growth as the regional average. Areas within a half mile grew 50% faster. And areas in this region that were isolated from rail transit underperformed the region as a whole. We also see that jobs provide a measure of resilience and jobs are more stable near transit. Look what happened during the recession 10 years ago, as shown in this graph. The seven county region as a whole had a 3.6% decrease in jobs from 2008 to 2009, but in the areas closest to rail, there were actually gains in employment. So this just goes to show how transit helps buffer during economic downturns. Transit's also important from the standpoint of the environment. I think we've all heard the dire warnings about climate change recently, and we have to acknowledge that transportation comprises 25% of the greenhouse gases that are emitted into our atmosphere. So this graphic here is from the Chicago City Greenhouse Gas Inventory from just a couple of years ago and we see that transportation comprises one quarter. So this is a large area where action can and should be taken to affect climate change. We need to be converting our auto trips to biking, walking, and transit. Now let's talk about new mobility. Uh, as, as mentioned, and as we all know, the transportation landscape has changed dramatically over the past few years. The term, Transportation network providers refers to Uber, Lyft, and Via, uh, which many people are using. These have really taken off in Chicago in the past few years. There are actually more than 65,000 licensed drivers in Chicago. That is people who drive at least four times per month. We also have seen um, over the past uh, several years, uh, Zipcar has been around for a while, which is car sharing and Car2Go came on the scene uh, just last year, which is a free floating car share program. And then we also have our beloved uh, Divi bike share program, which has been in place for a good five years. Um, so these, these new choices and sharing platforms have really changed the landscape. And uh, it, it creates increased choices, but increased complexity as we set policy. Another issue that we need to think about is equity with respect to transportation. Uh, the Metropolitan Planning Council has been doing a lot of work in this area, and 
in uh, just a couple years ago, we crunched some numbers and released findings that there were dramatic racial disparities in commute times for residents within the city of Chicago. In fact, all of the top 20 census tracts with the highest commute times in the region, which is over 49 minutes, are located in Chicago. 80% of the population in those areas is represented by non-white residents, so black or Latino residents. In contrast, the census tracts with the shortest average commute times in the city of Chicago, which is around 22 to 27 minutes, 70, 17 to, to 20 of them, of 20 of them are represented by a white majority. So these maps tell the story well. Spots are red on both maps that show where residents with longest commute times reside. Blue spots represent tracks with large, with shortest commute times on average. So it goes to show that there are great discrepancies within the city of Chicago in terms of how long it takes to get places. And there's certainly a complex set of factors. Uh, transportation is a part of it. Development, affordable housing are all parts of it. But we need to acknowledge that these are patterns that we need to change. When we look at transportation safety, there's a, a major safety problem in terms of the fact that 132 people were killed on Chicago roads in 2017. The majority of them were in vehicles, but we had almost 50 pedestrians killed on Chicago streets and six cyclists. And that pattern has been in place for quite a number of years and we're really struggling to make progress on it. As you see in this graphic, the numbers have bounced around uh, and we just had an increase between 2017 and 2018. So while we as a society say safety is a top priority, we're just not making progress when we look at the numbers. We're not getting the outcomes we want, and this is something that we need to take um, more seriously. The city of Chicago did create a safety plan, a Vision Zero plan that was released in 2017, and a quarter high crash quarter framework, which was released in 2018. And so there is um, an, a beginning uh, step to work on this, but we also want to point out uh, this work showed that crashes are very predominant in low income areas and communities of color. So there's a large equity component to traffic safety and the neighborhoods shown in this graphic um, need to be prioritized in terms of vision zero, which is an effort to get to zero fatalities or serious injuries. So what is the aldermanic role in all of this? Um, there are a lot of complexities, as, as I've mentioned, in terms of transportation planning. There's been a lot of upheaval, and it seems like every day there's a new technology that claims it's gonna solve all of our problems. But the reality is none of them does on its own. Mobility is complex and involves many different elements, including human choice and human behavior. So how do we find the right mix and the right distribution of space and the right costs? It's been useful for people in the transportation profession to step back when faced with all these decisions and try to remain centered on the goals for the city and then ask how the question at hand supports achieving those goals. So that's that can be a broad framework when um, presented with complex questions and decisions. Now I'm going to walk through some of the actions that you can take as aldermen to advance transportation in the city. And again, we'll we'll focus on these same priority areas, funding, sustainability, role in climate change, new mobility, equity, and safety. When we talk about funding uh, and reform, we definitely need, need more funding for transportation, um, but it's also critical that we are focusing any resources that we have on the best uses, that these be on multimodal projects, um, and that transportation funding is increased at the state and regional level. We also need to increase transparency on investment priorities. If we want the public to support increased funding for transportation, we need to be clearer about how we're making those decisions on where we're spending. In the graphic, you see uh, a picture of sort of an opportunity-driven process, and we won't focus in great detail on that. Um, but the big difference when um, taking a policy-driven process is really staying focused on transportation goals. And while that does allow for opportunities and spending when opportunities arise, um, it's really important to take a policy-driven 
approach, uh, and that will allow us to use um, performance criteria and data to prioritize investments, and especially to focus on the disinvested communities. As we've as we've mentioned, um, there are large swaths of the city that are having significant challenges in terms of safety and travel times. It's also critical that we prioritize sustainable modes of transportation in order to address climate change. So the city of Chicago developed a few years ago a complete streets Chicago policy, which is in existence and is online, these design guidelines. But what's really important to notice is this hierarchy that this guidance developed, that pedestrians should be prioritized number one as a, a vulnerable user of the transportation system, transit number two as a very efficient and cost-effective uh, and sustainable mode, bicycles, and then autos uh, last. And so it's important to actually implement these policies whenever we're faced with questions about what to do in a given quarter and a given street, it's very useful to refer back to this existing city of Chicago policy. But transportation is about more than just uh, those policies. It's also how those policies result in a context which people make sustainable choices. We want to make walking and biking safer and more appealing. Um, for example, reducing speed limits would have a great impact on pedestrian and bicycle fatalities. Transit must be integrated into the fabric of communities so that people want to use it. We need increased focus and resources dedicated on Vision Zero. And when revenue options like taxes and fees are considered, they should have the outcome of disincentivizing driving and making sustainable modes more appealing. Additionally, it's really helpful to remember that our transportation system is just that, a system. And so whenever an investment is being made, it needs to be thought of in terms of the entire context that it fits into. There's a picture here of the Roscoe Greenway um, in Lakeview, which was just completed uh, in the past several months. And what's really important about that is not necessarily that that's a project in the 44th Ward, but that that is intended to provide mobility for people from Western wards all the way to one of our greatest assets, which is our lakefront. And so um, that project be thought of in terms of a larger context of mobility for people getting all around the city from, from different wards to different destinations throughout the city. When we think about managing the new mobility future, uh, as alluded to, it's, it's really challenging. And um, these questions are, are facing us every day in terms of what modes we should be um, permitting into our city, uh, what types of regulations we should be requiring. And um, the city is gonna be continually faced with establishing policies and regulations as new providers seek to operate in Chicago. We see the pictures here um, of a bike, a bike share program that is quote unquote dockless. Um, the city tried a pilot last year of dockless bikes to complement Divi. Uh, and you know there are, there are complexities with those types of decisions. You see a scooter. There are no scooters allowed yet in Chicago, um, and we're going to be faced with deciding if they should be allowed, and if so, what regulations should be put on them. And then we see a picture also of autonomous vehicles. And uh, you know many people have high hopes for autonomous vehicles, but the the bullets on the left are some good considerations when any new type of technology is entering the ecosystem, that we really think about equity, disabled access, integrated information for users, and that we're regulating and pricing to incentivize biking, walking, and transit, and disincentivize people driving alone. In terms of equity, we've already touched on this. Um, again, biking, walking, and transit are the most affordable. Walking is free. Once you have your bike, biking is free or is very affordable. And so we want to make sure the infrastructure is there and also that the context is appealing um, for people of every background to take advantage of that infrastructure and those resources. And we want to prioritize investments in disinvested areas. Just quickly, I'll highlight some of the key departments that are providing transportation services and there are a range. Of course, the Chicago Department of Transportation is key. 
overseeing construction, planning, and actually operating Dibby Bike Share, which is managed by the city of Chicago. The Bureau of uh, the Chicago Transit Authority, of course, is um, the dominant transit system uh, in Chicago. Of course, we also have Metro terminating and PACE buses coming from the suburbs to Chicago, but um, the CTA is uh, is the dominant one. The Bureau of Business Affairs and Consumer, Consumer Protection actually plays a quite a significant role in its overseeing collection of fees, such as fees assessed to Lyft and Uber. The Department of Planning and Development oversees many large developments, uh, many of which have significant transportation components, such as planned manufacturing districts. Um, the mayor's office, certainly the, there will be a change there and it will be depend on the next mayor's preferences, but currently the, the sustainability function is housed there. Uh, and that's where certain policies are governed um, that may relate to transportation in terms of sustainability. And um, we also have uh, the Department of Streets and Sanitation. Um, we, we shouldn't forget them. They handle things like plowing snow, et cetera. So in terms of uh, how we approach the uh, overall transportation question at any given time, um, it's really helpful to just ask these questions up on the screen. Um, you know, as you may begin in the role of alderman, it's helpful to think about these questions sooner rather than later because we are forced to ask them at certain points. The bottom line is that every transportation investment should improve safety, increase multimodal ability, mobility, and reduce single occupancy vehicles, as well as improving conditions for communities of color. So this, this framework can be helpful in this complex landscape. So with that, uh, I'll remind everyone that if you have had any questions arise while you've been listening, please feel free to put them in the chat box uh, now before we turn on to the water topic. Um, and we will address them after Danielle gives her presentation about water infrastructure. So I'm going to turn it over to Danielle now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Audrey. Hello, everybody. Um, as Audrey said, my name is Danielle Gallet. I'm the director of water resources here at the Metropolitan Planning Council. I'm delighted to be talking with you today. Um, I'm going to be providing a, a briefing on our essential water systems. So the overview of the presentation is I'll, I'll give a, a quick overview of our water service system and infrastructure, and then I'll walk through some of the key issues we, we face as a city with regards to water service. Um, and then rounding it out, I will then highlight the great opportunities available to transform those issues, along with uh, specific actions and tools available to you as community leaders. So this image highlights the extensive infrastructure that the Chicago Department of Water Management operates and maintains. That includes 48,000 fire hydrants, 12 pumping stations, two water purification plants, 56,000 sewer structures, and a combined total of almost 9,000 miles of water and sewer mains. So as you can imagine, upkeep and maintenance on this infrastructure is critical to ensuring a safe, consistent drinking water service. Uh, current budgets for 2019 for the Department of Water Management look to be about $215.4 million. So here you can see two aerial images of the two water purification plants for the city of Chicago and beyond. Uh, the Jardine plant, which is on the left, is lo actually located on Navy Pier, and it's the largest water purification plant in the world. The Chicago water system provides potable water, otherwise known as drinking water, to approximately 5.4 million people every day, which amounts to just under 1 billion gallons of water a day being treated and distributed throughout Chicago and more than 100 neighboring suburban communities who purchase their drinking water from Chicago. The image on the left is of an intake crib, which is about two miles offshore. Water is collected and transported from here through tunnels, which are actually close to 200 feet uh, beneath the lake, to one of the two purification plants that we saw on the previous slide. The image on the right is of a pumping station. Once treated potable water, um, then flows by gravity to one of 12 pumping stations that are strategically located throughout Chicago. 
At the pumping stations, the water is actually elevated to our grid water mains and pressurized, which is what allows the water to be delivered to homes and businesses throughout our city. So while Chicago has its own combined sewer and stormwater pipes that it maintains within the city, in fact, there's over 4,400 miles of them, it is the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, otherwise known as MWRD, that is responsible for treating our wastewater and managing our stormwater for the larger Cook County region. So Chicago's sewer pipes connect to interceptors that bring our wastewater and stormwater to MWRD's water reclamation plants for treatment. And you can see this is an image of the Stickney Water Reclamation Plant, which is actually the largest wastewater treatment facility in the world. So Chicago region is home to the largest water purification plant, as well as the largest water uh, treatment plant facility in the world. This plant serves 2.3 million people in a 260 mile, square mile area, including the central part of Chicago and 46 suburban communities. This land actually encompasses 413 acres, and the plant can treat up to 1 million gallons of water per minute, which is similar to pumping two Olympic-sized swimming pools in one minute. Our water system infrastructure is extensive and an incredible asset, which has allowed Chicago and the greater region to thrive from both a public health as well as economic development standpoint. The men and the women that operate these systems 24-7 are just as important to our uh, community livability as police and fire service. So while we are fortunate to be located on the shores of Lake Michigan, one of the greatest freshwater lakes in the world, and have such a robust and extensive water infrastructure system, we are not without our water issues. So in the following slides, I want to highlight a couple of issues that as community leaders, uh, you need to be aware of and can help with the solutions for them. So the first one is our water infrastructure is old. Some of our pipes are actually still made of wood and were put in some of them over 100 years ago. Simply put, the infrastructure and the massive investment that our grandparents, our great grandparents, some of us, maybe even our great great grandparents put in is coming to the end of its useful life and the time for reinvestment has come due on our watch. The picture on the screen happened in Chicago in 2008. This was a long-term water leak. I want to note this was not a water main break, but a long-term slow leak that went undetected, eventually eroding away the street infrastructure until it collapsed. Luckily, it happened in the middle of the night, so no one was hurt. However, this image underscores the importance of regular, robust asset management and capital improvements for water infrastructure in order to avoid not only water and money waste, but also public safety concerns. The city of Chicago has begun a more aggressive replacement schedule, which is good, and we need to ensure this rehabilitation of our old infrastructure system continues. Another issue many of you have probably seen uh, on national and local news is lead in drinking water. Lead pipes have been used throughout the United States since the 1800s to supply drinking water. Due to its toxic toxicity, however, many US cities began moving away from using lead pipes by the 1920s. Chicago actually has the most lead service lines than any other city and actually required them by law until 1986 when federal Congress finally banned the use of this toxic material in water infrastructure. Now, while this ban greatly decreased the use of lead in new plumbing materials, it did not require remediation of older plumbing infrastructure. I want to stress there is no safe level of lead exposure, and it is time to get the lead out of our drinking water systems. This image demonstrates what and where lead service lines are. So uh, it's not just about pipes. Lead can also be in fixtures and leaded solder in homes, schools, and other buildings. But it points to the uh, why the issue is so complicated. First, we don't know where the lead pipes are. We don't have a really well mapped out or tracked when replacement happened, understanding of where these lead pipes are um, in the service lines. There's also not a general agreement on who is responsible for the remediation of these lead service lines. And I can pull up, you can see this is what we're talking about, that lead service line. 
So most commonly, lead service lines are often owned by the property owner, not the utility or the municipality. Another issue is that remediation is expensive. Estimated cost to replace a full lead service line can run anywhere from uh, around five to even $20,000, which puts lower income households and renters at a disadvantage. So there's a significant equity issue when we're addressing this issue as well. But I want to underscore, while the issue is complicated, not attending to it is irresponsible and negligible. Uh, this issue is a significant public health issue and needs to be addressed today. A third issue, uh, the Chicago region experiences a lot of flooding. From a statewide study, we know that 90% of flood damage claims were, locate, were located outside of nationally mapped 100-year floodplains. Sometimes the storms come in the form of dramatic events where transportation access and corresponding emergency services are actually cut off. Yet local drainage capacity, older structures, and a backlog of maintenance issues on our combined sewer and stormwater pipes can mean severe damages for even, for even just a small storm. And it's important to note that most of our stormwater infrastructure was designed based on precipitation trends that occurred between 1900 and 1980. The latest climate models for our region predict even more intense and frequent precipitation in the region. Hence, urban flooding is a pervasive and critical issue we will need to attend to in our city. This map by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning shows flooding damage payouts from just three federal programs between 2003 and 2015 in the Chicago region, which totaled 907 million in flood relief. 62% of all damage payouts occurred in Cook County, and you can see that many of the areas in blue are actually within the city boundary of Chicago. Yet flood damages are likely higher due to a variety of reasons. This can include a lack of private insurance company data, economic barriers, as well as confusion regarding flood insurance for homeowners, and then flooding associated with small storm events are not incorporated into these figures. The scale of the problem requires us to work and collaborate across agency and municipal boundaries. Another flooding impact is that it's an equity issue. From national studies, we know vulnerability to flooding appears to be greater for individuals already facing social vulnerability due to socioeconomic, demographic, and health factors. This map, again by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, looked at concentrations of both low-income families and minorities or limited speakers of English. Urban repeat flooding is an equity issue, and the solutions must include and be targeted for bringing relief to those who need it most. So a fourth issue on this happy train of issues that we're talking about here is the rising cost of water service. All of the infrastructure reinvestment issues we've been talking about will cost money to solve. Ensuring water rates capture asset reinvestment needs is important. However, continuing to just raise rates on water service is not the answer, given the regressive nature of that practice in that it hits those with the least the most. Sensitivity to how Chicago sets its water rates and can build in affordability programs and equity into its rate setting for those needing assistance will be critical as we dig ourselves out of what is known in the water industry as the replacement era for water infrastructure. Another, another issue and the final one I'll bring up here today is that water utilities around the country, including Chicago, have taken a, a public trust hit with regards to how it's managing everything from the lead pipes issue to transparency about water rates and poor customer service practices regarding water shutoffs. Trust has been damaged and needs to be rebuilt in order to garner the support our city needs to reinvest in our incredible water systems. Likewise, Chicago sells water to over 100 other surrounding communities. The image on the right demonstrates the complex web of how water from Lake Michigan is supplied out to our larger region. 
there are municipal customers that have or are considering purchasing their water from other suppliers instead of Chicago due to a lack of relationship in negotiations. There is an opportunity here for the city to transform this reputation and build better partnerships for the greater economic good of all of us. So I'd like to kind of bring us up on, from the downslide up into the upslide of talking about an opportunity for a new chapter. While it may have been a bit depressing to hear about the critical issues facing us with our water supply systems, the good news is that they're fixable. And attending to these issues provides a blueprint for achieving an inclusive world-class city by doing infrastructure investment that points towards Chicago being a true 21st century water smart city, by being good stewards of our water resources in order to attract economic growth and jobs, by building a bridge of trust and support with our citizens and suburban neighbors, and it's a real opportunity to address systemic, economic, and racial disparities that have been pervasive throughout our history as a city through targeted investment where needed most. So what will it take? It's gonna take creative creativity with revenue streams. It's going to take targeted investments in areas who need it most. We'll need to embrace the benefit of nature-based solutions, otherwise known as green infrastructure, throughout our wards. This green infrastructure provides more than just reduced, sorry about that everybody. So green infrastructure provides more than just relief from urban flooding. It also can provide community cohesion, cohesion reduce noise pollution, as well as crime rates, bringing them down. Ensuring our capital improvement projects use public funds most efficiently is also important. For example, making sure that when we're replacing main lines, we're also going in and replacing service lines at the same time. And it's also important for us to be working outside our municipal boundaries, to be good partners in order to save on costs and ensure our larger region is collectively and competitively attracting jobs and providing a high quality of life for our citizens. Finally, reaching out and engaging your constituents in conversations about water be it about lead pipes and fixtures or green stormwater infrastructure management. So what are the actions that you can do and take today? I've highlighted a number of ways that you can partner with city departments or regional uh, district agencies, uh, such as the Department of Water Management, where we can work towards building a program on lead service line inventorying, as well as replacement plans and getting our city 100% metered to make sure that we're able to track asset conditions over time. Another is working with the finance department on the billing and customer relationship issues in order to improve water service relations with our citizens. And finally, with the partnership, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, um, working with them on green as well as gray infrastructure planning installation for our stormwater issues. We can't underscore enough that actions need to focus on citywide approaches to ensure equity. Citizens suffering from the most, the most from these issues often have the least amount of resources. We have an opportunity to change that conversation and go where we're needed most. Again, educating your constituents, underscoring all of this is the opportunity to really un unify together at the city council level for doing the right thing for our citizens now and into the future. So I wanted to leave a couple of tools here for you. Um, there are a number of them available. The one on the left is the Drinking Water 123. This is an online interactive guide. It was specifically designed for people like yourself, community leaders and elected officials, to best understand even more uh, about the drinking water needs of our, of our city as well as our region, and it highlights best practices for that. We've also created a one page sheet that you can use and as well as pass out to your constituents as far as empowering them on steps they can take to protect themselves about lead in drinking water, um, educate them, as well as what steps we can take at city council to uh, uh, start to tackle that issue. Additionally, uh, we have a couple of other resources, Steady Streams, again, online resource. Um, this talks about how we can attend to the urban flooding and establish creative uh, revenue streams to attend to the, those issues. 
Um, and we also have a collaborative that meets regularly on the right that um, really is honing in on best practices, tools, and engagement for ensuring that uh, we're working at all different scales uh, on the urban flooding issue. So that concludes my formal presentation here. At this point, Audrey and I would like to open up the floor. Um, thank you for your time and attention and welcome your questions. And we're gonna actually go silent here for a moment while we wait for those questions to roll in. Thanks for your patience. Hi, we have, um, this is Audrey Wenink, the transportation director again. We have a question here about how can we get transit ridership to grow? And there's a few different ways of looking at this question. Um, one, it's important for people to know that uh, our transit system is, is very mature it's, and it's old and it needs money to be maintained. So, uh, at the state level, transportation funding does not go to transit capital, has not historically. And so as uh, city legislators who may uh, need to spend a little time talking to Springfield about raising money for transportation, it's important to know that dedicated funding for transit capital investment is really important to Chicago, um, given CTA's age and maturity. So once we have a better maintained system that certainly makes it more attractive to riders. Um, other things we can do include prioritizing um, buses on streets. Uh, the, the average speed of buses is below 10 miles per hour at this point, given the levels of traffic congestion. And so there are some things that can be done with our existing roads to either dedicate lanes for buses or install transit signal priority whereby buses can uh, jump ahead uh, uh, of cars at intersections. Um, and then thirdly, uh, pre-tax transit benefits. Um, many people have experienced when they're onboarding at a new job, uh, they may get asked if they wanna save a part of their paycheck to pay for transit. Well, if you, if you haven't been asked, I, I, I hope you will be asked in the future uh, because Chicago is actually pretty low in our, in our adoption compared to other regions on that. And um, there are other cities like New York, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco that actually require all companies over a certain size to allow um, people to save their uh, salaries, some of, a portion of their salaries for pre-tax, paying for transit pre-tax, which makes it more affordable and more attractive. So those are just a a few things related to infrastructure and, and policy that can be done to incentivize transit use and improve the experience. And um, now um, I think Danielle, you had a question? Yeah, so a question came in about um, uh, any recommendations for shared cost between the city and residents regarding replacement of lead pipes um, and what is the projected infrastructure um, cost on the city for that? So. Um, Great question. I would say that um, right now there's a there's a number of different ways that other municipalities are looking at funding lead service rhyme replacement. There is um, there that we're still looking to identify where grant programs might exist so that full lead service line replacement could be paid for under a grant program. But currently, oftentimes municipalities are covering the cost for up to half of the lead service line and then either um, charging the homeowner um, with their consent um, to then pay off their half of the lead service line cost over time on their water bill as an example for that. 
Um, as far as knowing what the cost is, um, honestly, the, the jury is still out because of the issue of understanding the inventorying of where lead service lines actually still exist. Um, we don't have a full understanding of um, how many there are or where they are or how long it will take or much less cost to replace them. So studies need to be absolutely done on that and we're working on that um, uh, in particular with the state legislation to um, be doing the inventorying and, and creating plans for that over time. Thanks, Danielle. Okay, now we'll go back to a question about transportation. Um, there was a question about how can we make more progress on safety? Uh, how can we stop having over 100 people die on Chicago's roads every year? Um, one important thing to know about the city's Vision Zero program is that there isn't a dedicated, uh, there hasn't been a dedicated allocation to fund that program. And many other cities have um, put more resources behind that in terms of both infrastructure and education. So that is, that's an area where we could fund that program and we have a plan. So we have an idea of the strategies that we need to undertake. Uh, I would also mention that um, anything we do to slow vehicle speeds will reduce um, the severity of crashes. So for example, establishing 20 mile an hour zones in neighborhoods, especially those with high crash rates, uh, would be a great step. Um, and then overall, anything we do to prioritize um, shifting people onto transit, you have almost a 0% chance of dying when you're in a bus or on a train. Uh, compared to a car, you actually, they're pretty dangerous. So the more we shift people out of cars um, and reduce the vehicle miles traveled, um, the better we're off in terms of overall safety performance. And it's been shown that regions that have higher transit ridership have fewer uh, traffic fatalities. Great, thank you, Audrey. So we had two questions come in on the water stuff. Um, one of them was, um, can we require homeowners to provide information about their uh, presumably lead service lines before new homeowners um, take and, and occupy the building. Um, this is a really great point that um, MPC is definitely interested in and I think um, as community leaders working at City Hall and, and elsewhere that um, you can really help to provide the, the dialogue that's needed with the real estate industry. Uh, currently, um, many of you may be familiar with disclaimers required for lead paint in homes. Um, the idea would be that uh, in, in order to help us track and really over time understand the inventory of where lead service lines are that maybe at the point of real estate sale um, that being disclosed. Obviously there are some negative connotations to that but it would definitely help to speed up um, and provide transparency for um, everyone involved with regards to identifying and, and doing something about the lead service lines during a real estate transaction. The second question that came through was um, uh, someone curious about how is Chicago's Lake Michigan supply governed, um, which is a really great question. Um, it's important to note that when we look out on, on Lake Michigan, you know, most of us in Chicago are like, oh, the myth of abundance, right? What's, what's the problem? But actually, the state of Illinois um, is under a U.S. Supreme Court decree that limits the amount of water that we can take out of Lake Michigan in any given year. It is not an unending well for us. And the reason for that is that we reverse the rivers. So um, we have effectively removed ourselves from the watershed of the Great Lakes. And so all of the water that we take and use for drinking water and for other purposes never gets back returned back into Lake Michigan. Um, and so it's really important that our own stewardship of this water source, since it's a complete, what's referred to as a complete diversion of uh, Lake Michigan water, we're, that we're, we're using that water efficiently. Um, and so needing to make sure that we're a good steward of that and that we're keeping our numbers and usage low um, is really important because it's not only from a stewardship and good conservation practices, it's also to ensure that other communities down the road that may need Lake Michigan water um, may be able to have access to it in our state. Thank you. Okay, and then we'll bounce back to transportation again. Um, there is a question about uh, scooters. Should Chicago allow scooters? What are the costs and benefits of that? Uh, and that's probably a question that will be presented to future aldermen. Um, in, in reality, uh, 
there's great interest in uh, operating scooters in Chicago. Scooters are in operation in many major cities around the country. If you've traveled, you've seen them. Uh, and the good news is that we have a lot of lessons learned from those other applications. Um, and so probably this is something we should consider piloting here in Chicago. There was a, some research conducted by the Chaddock Institute at DePaul recently about scooters, um, looking at what slot they might fit in the transportation context. And scooters are ten, generally ridden uh, longer distances than what than walk trips, shorter distances than biking. And so there might be a, a, a real niche for them, especially in terms of providing access to transit for people that are just a little too far away from, um, from transit to walk. But uh, there are a lot of other considerations as well in that um, we'd wanna make sure in terms of the way we regulate uh, those companies that we make sure we get um, appropriate data from them in terms of once a pilot were operational, we would want to put in place from the beginning a requirement that they share information with the city on where scooters are being used, uh, what times of day and where, so that we can make intelligent planning decisions after the pilot's over in terms of where to go from there. We'd want to make sure that there were an equity provision um, or, or equity provisions and in that we'd want to make sure that there's a way for people to participate if they don't have a credit card or they don't have a bank account um, that they could have a, a mechanism for um, paying for use of a scooter by going to their nearest drugstore and paying for some type of pass or or some mechanism like that um, the divi program currently has a divi for all um, payment mechanism which which does that and so something similar to that um, other things that we run into with these types of technologies is the distribution of the vehicles uh, where are the scooters in the city and where are they available for people to use and so there can be provisions that require scooters to be distributed in different places so that we could require that scooters be distributed to low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color or um, you know, in, in different ways that we feel are appropriate. Um, and then maybe the fourth point I would make is there's great concern with scooters about sidewalk clutter uh, and them tipping over and being in the way and where do they get parked because they wouldn't have docks like, like Divi does. And so uh, the companies that operate scooters have made great strides in helping to control where people park um, and we would we would just want to put uh, requirements in there for that. And those those techniques include creating virtual docking stations so that a person who has uh, a cell phone that's using a scooter and or else there's a there can be a screen on the scooter actually like on the handlebars, a person that's getting ready to park, that screen could actually give them guidance on where it's allowed to park so that they're kind of quote unquote not allowed to park um, in certain places and they're required to park in other places. So they're sort of the parking zone for scooters that's designated um, and and other things. So just that there would need to be good mechanisms in place to control parking, to enforce that, and to make sure that we don't have sidewalk clutter that um, would negatively affect people with disabilities that are using the sidewalks or people walking, et cetera. And, and it's good with a brand new technology to do it as a pilot first and then have lessons learned so that we can make changes from there. So at this point, um, I think we've gotten through the questions that have come through. So there's actually oh, there's one more. Yeah, there's okay. one more that came through um, with regards to stormwater management. Um, uh, the question is if stormwater vortexes are causing um, critical issues for residents, uh, what can we do for them? The idea of a, a stormwater vortex, I've never heard that term before, but it, it sure is fantastic and certainly points to the image of, of what we're talking about. Um, but as far as uh, stormwater flooding and, and the concerns about public safety and all of that, um, one of the most important things is whether it's in your ward or in your local neighborhoods, um, being able to you know, identify where local flooding happens on a regular basis, mapping that out, communicating that to elected officials, um, coming up with a plan for um, utilizing either ward funds or other avenues, um, and that we could talk about that offline as well. Um, a whole host of um, ways to invest in nature-based green infrastructure. So uh, depending on the severity of the issue, 
um, looking at how you could do uh, curb bump outs or put in bioswales and rain gardens to prevent that at least on street kind of um, issues of concern within your neighborhoods and in your wards and, and across the city. So with that, um, we have rounded out all of the questions. Um, we have a qu few quick closing notes before you leave. First, we have another webinar coming up next week that will feature Marisa Novara, Kendra Freeman, and Christina Harris. And they'll be discussing housing and community development issues within the city. Uh, second, we'll be posting all of these recordings of the entire webinar series on our website, and we'll be sure to send out the links to that to all of you in attendance in the next couple of weeks. Finally, it's important to note that, as Audrey noted, MPC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, so we are not able to endorse particular candidates. However, we are very happy to be a resource for all of you. We definitely, truly thank you for your time and your participation, and we hope to stay engaged with all of you as you go forward and help make our city a better place. Thank you for tuning in.